Hello, everyone. My name is David Shirley. I'm professor of agricultural food and resource economics at, at Michigan State University. And I'm also serving as director of the USAID Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Food Security Policy Research Capacity and Influence, a very long name, which we've come to, to, to call PRCI. So it's the USAID Food Security Policy Innovation Lab, which we call PRCI. It is really my great pleasure to, uh, to welcome you to this webinar today called Integrating Gender and Policy in Policy Research and Outreach. Um, this is being jointly organized by PRCI together with the International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI, who is a key partner with us in, in, in uh, PRCI, and also by the CGIAR Research Program on Policies institutions and markets known as, as as PIM. So I'm first going to give you a very brief background on PRCI and why we are hosting this seminar and then and then give you a bit of background on the seminar before introducing our speakers. So PRCI is as I said one of uh, Feed the Future's key mechanisms for generating empirical information to uh, inform food security policy decision making in Africa, Asia, and also Latin America. It has a global mandate. And we really approach this, um, this challenge, if you will, fundamentally from an institutional capacity building perspective, right? So we work very hard in PRCI to put our African and Asian and eventually potentially Latin American partners in the lead you know, within a consultative approach and consultative framework in the lead in defining their objectives, um, identifying the capacities that they really need to be able to meet those objectives, and then organizing together with us uh, to develop those capacities, to strengthen their, to, to build on their strengths and to, and to fill uh, some of their gaps. Um, and, and one of these areas very much uh, that is receiving increasing attention over time and a lot of emphasis um, and increased appreciation of its importance is the area of gender issues in policy and research. So as you all might know, gender equality is one of the sustainable development goals. And it's also key to attaining all kinds of, of other goals from, from um, uh, productivity growth, uh, to improve nutritional outcomes. Many of the goals central to the development challenge depend very much on gender equality. And yet it is not often clear what this actually means, what pursuing gender equality means and, and how to go about that, what it means in practice. And then it's not clear what kinds of knowledge and interventions are needed to contribute to these goals. So this webinar um, is going to discuss key gender issues, key elements um, of, the, of this challenge, and it's going to focus on processes for integrating gender um, into each stage of the research process, okay? That will include how do you go about setting uh, priorities, how do you design your research, what kinds of specific methodologies to use, how do you go about conducting the research then in a, in a, in a gender sensitive uh, manner? And then how do you communicate your results so that you have the, the level of impact and the breadth of impact with the types of people that you wanna have impact with? So with that introduction, um, I want to introduce now our speakers. We have two really fantastic uh, speakers that are gonna be sharing uh, many years and great depth of, of, of experience and knowledge with you. Ruth Mines and Dick is a senior research fellow at IFPRI. Uh, there she leads research on natural resource management, collective action, and, and property rights. She was, uh, she's a development sociologist who uses both qualitative and quantitative methods in her work. Um, and these have really come together in creating what I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, which is the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index, which is really becoming a great tool for mainstreaming gender um, in research and, 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 and in, in programmatic initiatives. So Ruth is also IFPRI's Gender Task Force, leader of, of, of IFPRI's Gender Task Force, 
when it set up teams to integrate gender into their work. Okay. Elizabeth Bryan is a senior uh, a scientist, also at IFPRI. Welcome, Elizabeth. There she conducts policy relevant research on sustainable ag production, natural resource management, and small scale uh, irrigation. Also, she looks at issues of climate change, adaptation, and gender. She kind of mainstreams gender in all of the work that she does. So her current work focuses on trade-offs and synergies across the intersection of climate smart ag, nutrition, gender, um, and the environment. And Elizabeth regularly publishes and regularly presents her results on this whole series of, of, of topics that I just referred to. Um, so with that, before we hand it over to Ruth and Elizabeth, I did want to turn it to uh, our colleague Evgenia, who's going to go through um, some, uh, some, some notes about how we actually proceed in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, good morning, everyone. Just a short logistical note. The presentation will last for about 45 minutes with the rest of the time dedicated to questions and answers. During the presentation, we invite webinar participants to send in questions via the chat window on the right side of your screens. We will collate these questions and group any that are similar in content. We will then relay them to our presenters during the Q&A session. Uh, know that we are recording the webinar and we will make it available on our website shortly after the live event. And by our website, I mean pmcgir.org, where probably most of you saw the initial information about the webinar. With that, over to... Thank you, Evgenia uh, and Dave for the introductions. Um, and uh, this has been... I hope that this will be a useful uh, introduction to to gender issues. Uh, on the next slide, we have a box um, that's labeled the gender box. And I think it's a great image of what, uh, how gender often seems to people, that um, there is this locked thing that's, that's there and you think maybe it's important, maybe there's something interesting in it, but you're not quite sure how to get into it. So what we're going to try and do today is uh, help you unpack that box, provide you the keys on that, some of the keys. So on the next slide, we have uh, some terminology. I realize this may be old hat for many of you, but I'm going over it because we see a lot of um, confusion in the terminology. First of all, gender is socially constructed relationships or differences between men and women. That includes roles, responsibilities, and opportunities that are associated with being male or female in a given culture. It's going to vary between cultures, and it can change over time. Sex, on the other hand, refers to biological differences. That's different from gender. <clears throat> and also, gender is not equal to women because men are also a crucial part of gender. That means that you should be referring to women's empowerment or gender equality or gender equity. Uh, I tend to cringe when I see gender empowerment because I'm not quite sure what that means. Similarly, male and female are adjectives that describes something, so you don't talk about males doing something. Um, and then men and women are adult uh, people. Um, on the next slide, we have some basics of gender analysis. Uh, the remind this picture is a reminder that um, there can be men, women, and children, uh, boys and girls. Gender analysis is a set of tools for uncovering the differences between men and women, boys and girls, to ensure that our research produces policy recommendations that are appropriate for both men and women. Now, those tools may be qualitative or quantitative or both, and a lot of the rich gender analysis combines the two. But we're going to focus mostly on the quantitative in this webinar, and perhaps we'll do a follow-up about qualitative and integrating um, 
in another time. Which differences are most important is going to depend on the context. So gender analysis isn't necessarily about finding the right answers, or certainly not universal right answers, because what's right is going to really depend on the context and the circumstances. But gender analysis is about also about right, asking the right questions, and that's what we're going to focus on today. In the next slide, we go over when does it make sense to make pay attention to gender in your research. That's when there are systematic gender differences in the outcomes, such as yield differentials between men and women's plots, or health and nutrition outcomes, um, or when there are differences in the determinants, such as the effects of male and female schooling, um, land ownership, or differences in the processes, such as when there are differences in the preferences, motivations, and behavior of men and women. Now, if you think about those three questions, that's pretty much a lot of, of the time. When you look for those different gender differences, you start to see them. Next slide. Uh, we have key questions to ask. So, one is, for example, what different roles or what different stakes do women and men have in X, whatever the topic you're, you're talking about is? How might a policy or intervention affect them differently? Will both men and women realistically be able to participate and to benefit? For example, if um, it's going to take a lot of time are women or men more time constrained to be able to participate? Will it take certain assets to be able to pursue a, a new livelihood opportunity? How might differential participation of men and women, uh, boys and girls, affect the project activities and the impact of that project or pro, uh, policy? And how could the research contribute to gender equity? Next. In, I'm not going to go over a lot of the logic for why gen, it's important, except to say that in agriculture, there, it is a highly gendered area. The FAO State of Food and Agriculture 2011 provides a lot, a good summary of the evidence and also challenges some of the, the myths um, and basically points that women are disadvantaged in uh, a lot of control over assets and inputs, as well as in human capital, um, but uh, that that then has reproduction repercussions on productivity. Next. Also, uh, addressing gender is important for reducing poverty, again, because um, Women are often more constrained uh, than men in terms of a, not only um, assets and resources, but uh, protections under um, customary or statutory legal systems, decision making, time burdens. It, uh, in many cases, women are subjected to threats or acts of violence, but a gender analysis will also show that in many places, men are subjected to certain kinds of, of threats of violence. So if you interventions don't anticipate those unique dimensions of poverty or identify those constraints, they often fail to reach their objectives or could even have unintended consequences. Next. So if you can close this gender resource gap, for example, you can get a, an increase in productivity. Um, and th again, the, the FAO State of Food and Agriculture gives examples of this and shows how they could have multiplier effects um, on, on other economic and social factors because in particular women often spend more on food for their family 
and they're in there's evidence that their incomes are more strongly associated with uh, child health and nutrition. Uh, but again, that's context. It depends on the context. If we go to the next slide, uh, we see some misconceptions about gender research, that it's not only about child nutrition or schooling. Um, women and men are economic, political, and social actors, and men are also involved in, in nutrition and schooling. Also, gender research is not just about women. Um, as I said, it, it focuses on men and the differences in relationships between men and women and boys and girls. Not all women or men are the same. You have to consider what we call the intersectional identities. Um, if you uh, just look at differences between men and women, you may miss those differences among women or men. For example, differences by their marital status, age, size of landholding, wealth, ethnicity, religion, caste, class, education. And those other factors may be more or less important in different contexts. Gender studies have a lot to offer on how to analyze these factors. So if you're going to look at youth, look into the gender literature on this because there's a lot to offer. Finally, gender is a lot more than just female-headed households. And I hope we'll go, come into why that's important. Go on. There, are, there have been two broad economic models of the household. A lot of the literature looks a, uses what's called a unitary model that assumes that everybody in the household pools everything. They have the same preferences, goals, and the household head is the benevolent dictator. He knows all, and it's usually he, makes the best decisions for everyone. And differences among the household members don't really matter. That has been basically shown to not apply in, in reality. So then there was a rise of a bargaining model or a various bargaining models where households have individuals with different preferences, and then the allocation of resources and activities within the household is determined by bargaining among those individuals based on their different bargaining power. Next. Reality is a lot more complex. Households don't act as one um, in making decisions or pooling resources, but the pure bargaining model also isn't quite accurate because there are often very there are often shared interests and resources. So intra-household decision making is complex. There's some autonomy and some jointness, depending on the decision and the degree to which the interests of different actors in the household are aligned. The next uh, figure has a a model where we've tried to um, show some of, encompass some of that complexity. So every element here from the uh, context on through has some things that may be in, uh, separate from men and women and some things illustrated by white in the middle that are joint. So assets, uh, the, um, in my household, for example, our house is a joint asset. My jewelry is, is an individual asset and my husband's tools are his individual asset. Um, shock <laughs> similarly may, may affect everybody together or may affect uh, men and women differently. Uh, assets and shocks are related as we'll hear in re on the resilience discussion, but those jointly affect the livelihood strategies that households pursue. Um, again, men and women may have different livelihood strategies or there may be joint farm production, for example. That yields full income, which includes uh, 
the income includes um, the value of time, which is allocated between consumption and savings and investment. Here's where bargaining power often does play a role in how that uh, income gets allocated, and jointly that affects well being. Um, we can come back to that later if you want more details. Next. So if we're talking about gender analysis, there are different levels. A lot of what is done is just comparing household type, comparing male-headed and female-headed households. Um, I would like to point out that that's really a comparison of household types. It's not a full gender analysis. Um, the next, we see that in you can also have a comparison of individuals, men, women. Um, you can have an in, uh, gender analysis that includes children as well. Um, and it's very important because, for example, the majority of women are in um, are not in female-headed households. So you can't use female-headed households as a proxy for women. Next. Um, you also then have plot level analyses where you can look at male managed plots, female managed plots, or jointly managed plots. And this is again where that jointness comes in. Yeah, go on. If you do have a gender sensitive uh, development program or one that aspires to be, um, a lot of their there's a lot of fuzzy terminology. So we've tried to clarify this by saying there are three types. Um, we call them reach, benefit, empower. Reaching means including women in the program activities. Benefiting is a higher level, a uh, higher bar, where it really says in, it, the project would increase women's well-being, whether that's food security, income, or health. Empowering women means strengthening their ability to make strategic life choices and put those choices into action. Now, the strategies and activities you do to reach that uh, will be different and different indicators. As the next slide shows, with an example from nutritious crops uh, through ex agricultural extension, the reach would be just about delivering agricultural extension services to women, whether or not those actually um, are meeting their needs. Um, that would mean providing transportation or making sure that the meetings are, the training is convenient for them. And indicators are simple on proportion of women attending. Benefiting would really say that it has considered women's preferences and constraints in designing the training. And you would look at indicators of sex disaggregated data on yield or income, for example. And empowerment is increasing women's agency. That means enhancing their decision-making power and your indicators would have to refer to, to things like that. On the next slide. We go into more details on empowerment. Um, and uh, Naila Kabir uh, identifies three important areas for empowerment. Resources, agency, and achievements. The resources are the material, human, and social resources that allow one to exercise choice. Um, agency is the capacity to define one's own goals and make strategic choices and pursue those, especially where that was previously denied, and achievements are the achievements of those goals. Next. Um, we have, uh, of the, the three resources, agency, and achievements, um, achievements, there's a lot of indicators about you know, yield or, or income, although it needs to be sex disaggregated. Resources also, there have been big advances such as the gender asset gap study, 
and others on how do you measure sex disaggregated data on resources. Um, empowerment was the harder one to measure. So we have been tackling that with the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index um, that measures inclusion of women in the agriculture sector. Uh, it's a survey-based index interviewing men and women in the same household designed for population-based surveys. Um, it was launched in 2012 by USAID, IFPRI, and the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. Um, then we've developed a project level WEA or pro -WEA. Again, it's a survey-based in index um, that's adapted to assess the impact of, of particular agricultural development projects. So it has some additional indicators like mobility. And there's a whole WEA resource center on that. I'll just go over a couple of highlights in the next uh, two slides. So next one. Oh, the, in the uh, pro WEA, we look at three kinds of agency, intrinsic, instrumental, and collective. The intrinsic is the power within, instrumental is the power to, and the collective is power with. Next. Um, those three domains of empowerment are 90% of the PROWEA and the 10% is the gender parity index, whether women's achievements relative to the primary male in the household. Next. And there are 12 indicators of empowerment in here. Um, this uh, color wheel shows uh, broadly what they are. I'm not going to go into them in detail right now. The, the wea.ifpre.info resource site has a lot more on this and we will be uh, launching a, a distance learning uh, course with much more detail about this. But so this is a, a teaser to hope uh, that those who are interested would, would uh, follow up with that course. I'm going to now turn it over to Elizabeth to go into more um, some um, examples and data for gender analysis. Thank you so much, Ruth. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the data sources that are available for doing a gender analysis, um, even without all of the wonderful WEA data that Ruth just described to you, there are other ways to look at differences across men and women and to measure women's empowerment with other existing data sets that you may have or want to use. Or there may be questions that could be added to a household survey that you're planning to roll out so that you can get more at these individual differences between members of the household. Many uh, household data sets already ask questions, for example, about who in the household owns particular assets, or who may have been contacted by extension agents or other sources of information, or who actually borrowed credit. Agricultural surveys, such as the LSMS type surveys, typically include data on agricultural production at the plot level. Sometimes these also include a question about who in the household either owns or manages those particular plots. So that enables you to do some deeper analysis there. Other surveys include sex disaggregated modules like the WEA that Ruth just mentioned, um, which allow researchers to compare the primary responses of the male and female decision makers in the houses, in the same household. Uh, similarly, the DHS surveys also ask specific questions about women's empowerment related to health um, and typically look at responses from the male and female within uh, decision makers within the household. And I'm going back to the framework that Ruth presented on the three main elements of empowerment, which are resources, agency, and achievements. And these next several slides will show some specific indicators that are linked to these three main domains of empowerment. The subcategories shown on the leftmost column are different types of resources that you may want to measure with the data that you have. In the case of resources, these include natural capital, financial capital, social capital, human capital, and physical capital. 
and also other elements of the enabling environment that influence people's behavior. <clears throat> so if you're designing a household survey, oftentimes just adding a few additional questions can enable a deeper analysis of gender um, at the individual level. <clears throat> so for example, asking whether the household accessed credit in the last year, and then going a step further to ask who accessed the credit as a measure of financial capital would be important. Asking about land ownership or management at the plot level um, is an important measure of natural capital of men and women. Or asking about the level of education of each member of the household or other individual characteristics can be a measure of human capital at the individual level. And in the next couple of slides, I'll just show how this might look in a household survey. Almost every survey, household survey that I know, at, even at the household level, will include a roster of the members of the household. And this is an easy way to add on specific questions about those individuals, such as their age, their marital status, their uh, literacy status, and their uh, achievement of education level status. <clears throat> Similarly, um, when you ask about land or other types of productive assets, you can ask, who owns the land? Is it jointly owned? Is it owned by one member of the household? And when you get into production or how that land is used, you can ask about who uh, manages that particular plot of land. Looking at the indicators of um, agency, um, as Ruth mentioned, the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index really focuses on measures of agency because typically these were not included in a lot of household surveys. In the past, often we would see proxy measures of women's agency being used, um, such as assets brought to marriage, uh, due to an absence of really a rich data source for the different aspects of women's agency. Um, now we have various versions of the WEA that have been implemented in many countries, and new indicators are still being developed to capture different aspects of agency. <clears throat> This table shows the different subcategories of agency as defined by the pro WEA, which Ruth presented. And these are the instrumental agency, collective agency, and intrinsic agency. So many of the indicators, the specific indicators shown here are found in the pro WEA, but I would point out that proxy indicators are sometimes still used in other surveys that maybe don't collect the specific WEA data that can capture uh, certain aspects of agency. Um, the DHS is an important source that often captures um, certain data related to women's agency, for example. And here's a question from the DHS, um, which is you know, similarly captured in the WEA, where we ask about uh, different decisions and how these are made. So here we are looking at decisions regarding how income is used, whether it's uh, done by the respondent or the wife or partner or jointly. And the same can be asked about a number of different types of decisions that households make related to health care, related to major household purchases, related to the allocation of labor, for example. <clears throat> and finally, uh, we have achievements. And this shows a set of indicators that might be used or found in existing surveys to measure achievements. And as Ruth said, typically these are ones that can be readily found in available data sets. And we have several different subcategories here, which are education, participation in the economy, political engagement, health, violence against women, and nutrition. <clears throat> and so indicators related to health and violence against women and nutrition can often, again, be found in DHS surveys and in the pro -WEA. And some of these other indicators can often be found in national statistics or databases or even more macro level indicators. In terms of the intimate partner violence indicator, this is an example from the DHS, which asks both men and women whether a husband is justified in hitting or beating his wife in the following situations. And so this often can show the status of women in a particular context. Um, it has a lot of <clears throat> weight in terms of women's agency and status. And now I want to turn to a few examples to really illustrate how having a gender lens can enrich um, policy research in the agricultural space. And I'm gonna take some examples from the three main research topic areas of the PRCI project, which David introduced. 
And these research topics are healthy food systems, resilience, and inclusive agricultural transformation. And so the example that I'll talk a bit more about for healthy food systems is related to a project that looks at the influence of gender on irrigation to nutrition pathways. Under resilience, I'll talk about some research that we've done on gendered awareness and adoption of climate smart agriculture. And under inclusive transformation, I'm going to talk about a project example from cultural practice on agricultural value chains and gender. <clears throat> so the first example um, is related to agriculture nutrition pathways and how this is influenced by gender. And this particular image, there's a lot of different um, frameworks um, that sort of build on each other for looking at agriculture to nutrition pathways. This particular one um, builds in the example of looking at irrigation, which is often considered to be a nutrition smart agricultural intervention. <clears throat> And so this research demonstrates the important role of women's empowerment in shaping how these pathways play out, both directly and indirectly. This figure shows the pathways through which irrigation influences food security, nutrition, and health outcomes. And these pathways are a food production pathway there at the top. Um, irrigation can shape the types of crop choices that people make. It can increase their ability to produce nutrient-dense crops like leafy green vegetables. And it lengthens the production calendar, which enables them to stabilize food supply over the course of the year, which can have important nutrition implications. There's also an income pathway. So irrigation may increase production and incomes through the sale of irrigated crops. This income can then be used to increase food and non-food expenditures, which can lead to improved nutrition outcomes. And finally, in this particular case where we're talking about irrigation, there's also a water access pathway because irrigation can affect the water supply um, for the household, which can have both positive and negative effects on health and nutrition outcomes, depending on how that water is used and managed. So on the one hand, uh, it can increase water access for multiple purposes, including domestic purposes, which may have a positive implication for the, the household wash environment, on the other hand, it can increase health risks such as malaria if there's standing water um, around the household and if it's not properly managed. <clears throat> Irrigation also can directly affect women's empowerment by affecting their labor allocation, for example. And this has direct implications for nutrition outcomes through changes in their own energy expenditure and their own ability to, to provide care for other members of the household, such as children. So that, that's sort of a direct pathway, but there are also indirect pathways. Women's empowerment intersects all of the other pathways from food production, agricultural incomes, and water access. So for example, in the production pathway, women may choose to plant different crops than men in the household, or for different purposes, they may choose to keep some of their crops that they produce for home consumption rather than for sale. And all of these choices have implications for the nutrition outcomes of the household. In Bangladesh, for example, we found women's empowerment to be linked with greater production diversification away from rice, for example. Women's empowerment also influences the income pathway. So who controls income is also very important. Women tend to prioritize expenditures towards food, health, and education. So if they have more control over income decisions, then they can influence the nutrition outcomes that way. And finally, the water supply pathway is also important. Women's management of water for domestic purposes is essential to mitigate risks and take advantage of opportunities of irrigation water becoming more available to the households. So what does all of this mean for um, policy and programs? <clears throat> we need to consider women's preferences um, across agriculture to nutrition pathways, as well as the constraints that they may face. The research shows us that women actually face a lot of constraints in accessing and benefiting from an expansion of irrigation technologies. <clears throat> and these need to be taken into account. And so that agricultural interventions can be designed in a way that ensure that both men and women are able to participate and that they're able to benefit. And it's important also for these interventions to monitor differential outcomes between men and women because these can play out in unexpected ways. So for example, our research around small-scale irrigation in northern Ghana shows that 
when motor pumps were given to small groups of both men and women farmers, the women ended up turning those pumps over to their husbands. So whereas the project assumed that if women got access to the motor pump, that would increase their control over this particular productive asset, but that didn't turn out to be the case. Um, but what we did find was that having access to a motor pump meant that men actually allocated more of their labor to irrigation, which then freed up women's time to engage in other livelihood activities. And that was seen as a positive outcome among both men and women in the household. And another example from Tanzania found that irrigation increased the need for households to be able to store crops. But when warehouses were introduced, we found that men often took over storing and selling the produce. And so women actually had less control over decisions related to the output of irrigated production. So I'll move on to the next example, which is related to awareness and adoption of climate smart practices. And this example is to really illustrate that we can't just look at adoption at the household level, but we need to consider who in the household is adopting different technologies and why, what are the determinants of that? So this table here shows a set of climate smart adaptation practices on the left-hand side. And <clears throat> what we found from data that we've collected is that men tend to be much more aware of these different set of climate smart practices than women. So all of the highlighted blue boxes under the awareness column show areas or practices that men tended to be more aware of. This is largely related to men's greater access to information in various contexts, um, but there are lots of other factors at play as well. And what we find then is that men have greater awareness and they also tend to be more likely to adopt practices for climate smart agriculture. However, when we condition adoption of a particular practice on men's and women's awareness of that practice, we actually see that women are more likely in some cases to adopt practices that they're aware of. These typically relate to practices that they may prefer or ones that are related to their gender roles in the household. In this case, in Bangladesh, we see women are more likely to adopt um, improved feed management strategies for livestock and improved grain storage practices. <clears throat> so increasing women's awareness is one way to help get over this gender gap in climate smart agriculture adoption, but awareness is not the only constraint. So what does this mean for policy and, and programming? As I said, there are lots of other constraints that women face in responding to climate change, such as their lack of control over productive assets, uh, more limited bargaining power to make decisions that meet their own needs and preferences in the household. So understanding different gender roles, preferences, and constraints are really key to designing interventions that increase women's participation in and the benefits that they get out of climate smart agriculture. Because women have important contributions to make, it's important to ensure that these programs also meet their needs. We can't scale climate smart agriculture um, by just reaching men farmers. We need to make sure that women are also included, that they're adopting these practices on the plots that they manage and in the roles that they lead. And the last example relates to integrating gender in agricultural value chains. Gender analysis in this space is really important because it can highlight important gender-based constraints and opportunities for more equitable and inclusive value chains. These include participation, um, performance, benefits, and empowerment. In terms of participation, uh, it's important to identify barriers to entry and or requirements for men's and women's active engagements in all of the nodes of the value chain. In terms of performance, we need to use gender analysis to understand the disparities between men's and women's ability to maintain or improve their position in the value chain. We also need to think about what benefits are coming out of the men's and women's uh, participation in value chains in terms of their access to and control over income, their asset accumulation, and other facets of well being that are derived from value chain participation. And we can also look at the empowerment effects of women's participation in value chains. So how can their participation lead to other improvements in their status in the household and in their communities? <clears throat>
And I would add that it's important to um, also mitigate any potential negative implications of commercialization of particular value chains, ones that relate to women's traditional production, for example. So if women are typically growing groundnuts for, for home consumption and these are getting commercialized, it's important to think about any displacement that may occur and to take measures to make sure that women are in, included in that commercialization process. And I'll just point out that this comes from a study um, by Deborah Rubin and colleagues on this area. So what are the policy implications of all of this body of research and years of practice on gender equality and agricultural value chains? First, um, we find that women may benefit economically, but this may not always increase their social status. And that other vehicles for women's empowerment are still important, such as women's participation in agricultural wage work. Value chain interventions need to be gender sensitive and they need to consider all of the barriers and opportunities that exist in a given context. And as Ruth emphasized before, all of these things are very context specific. And I'll just point to the last uh, bullet point. There's a lot of guidance out there on how to enable inclusive value chains. And so you can look up these references if this is an area of, of research that's interesting to you. And I just wanna to touch on in, in conclusion, um, you know, I think we've highlighted through the examples and some of the data sources, all of the ways in which, and the sort of benefits of really um, integrating gender into the research process. I think it brings a lot of nuance, it deepens the kinds of findings that we're able to to have and to communicate about to policymakers. And it actually has very important implications for policymaking because it might um, enable policymakers to better target policies or programs to better target their strategies to different individuals. And so it really adds a lot of richness to the work that we're already doing. And oftentimes it's, it's really about adding just a few additional questions or a few additional research um, questions to your overall portfolio of activities that it can bring a much, much deeper perspective. So we wanna make sure that, that gender is integrated across the entire um, project cycle of research projects from priority setting to research design. And this also includes uh, technology design and in the implementation and the conduct of research and in communicating those research results to have a better policy impact. And here we just have some data sources that will lead you to other places where you may be able to look up some of these indicators that we presented earlier. Uh, there's a lot of toolkits and frameworks that are able to help you think about how to do gender analysis um, in a particular research area, whether it's climate smart agriculture or measuring women's empowerment or other kinds of, of frameworks. And there are also a lot of uh, publications that you can draw on for more information. I'm not gonna read through all of these, but these slides will be posted after the fact and you can go ahead and, and look up some of these links. And thank you all so much for your attention. And I really look forward to answering your questions and hopefully collaborating more on gender research in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth and Ruth. Uh, I see that Ruth has uh, is with us now again on YouTube, and now we can go to the questions. We have received a few questions uh, during the course of the presentation, and please feel free to send us more. And I, I'm going to start with one that came in first, actually, from Fiona, and it reads like this. The gender being a social construct, how do we reconcile gender from Western perspectives to gender from the Global South perspectives? as this can affect how empowerment is used. Who wants to start, Ruth or Elizabeth? <clears throat> I'm, I'm happy to take a first crack yeah, at that. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, I think we, as we emphasized in the presentation, we realized that gender norms and gender rules are very context specific. And so gender analysis should really take a lot of these factors into account. We didn't talk as much about qualitative research in this presentation, but that is a really important tool for understanding how um, different communities actually view empowerment, how they define it themselves, and what their 
their own goals for empowerment are. And so that's really an important part of doing gender research is trying to understand what empowerment means to different people. We're not going in and defining it for them. We have ways of measuring it, but we also need to recognize that, that those pathways are gonna vary from context to context. And so uh, we hope that this research doesn't come off as imposing any particular value set or framework for understanding empowerment, but it, it provides a tool for, for richer um, engagement in the communities and understanding what that means for them. Ruth, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just to say that in developing the WEA and especially the pro WEA, we've used um, a lot of qualitative work to sort of validate the indicators that are in the survey. Um, and we, uh, the, the, the tools we've used for that are available online. The other um, rich set of qualitative approaches, um, there's something called the Genovate Initiative and G-E-N-N-O-V-A-T-E. -E. And if you Google that, you can find a lot more about that approach as well, which was a systematic way of looking at, at um, norms, uh, gender norms in agriculture. Thank you for this. Uh, there was one uh, more or less kind of technical question. Uh, how would one use WEA for women in women's headed households? Or is this still only applicable for male headed households? Um, so the, 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 the WEA has five domains of empowerment or the pro WEA has three. You can use that on, on any household, whether or not there is an adult male. Um, we generally refer, and then uh, we also have, the only thing that you can't do with a um, household where there is not a, an adult male, which is often referred to as a female headed household, is the um, gen, uh, gender parity index. And so what you do is you um, combine the 90% of the weighting comes from just the, um, the domains of empowerment indicators. And then you take 10% um, that weighting from the gender empowerment uh, GPI is applied as an average across those households that do have both men and women. Again, um, uh, there's more details on that on the, the WEA um, website. Okay, thank you, Ruth. Uh, do you want to add anything? No, I think it really okay. handled that one. Okay. Um, there was an interesting question. Where awareness did not lead to adoption? Can you reflect on why? Um, I think there's a, a long literature on many, you know, all the different determinants of adoption of agricultural technologies and climate smart practices. Information and awareness of the practices is obviously one of the critical ones, but there are many others. You know, if, if you may be aware of irrigation, but you don't have the money or access to credit to be able to purchase a pump or to, you know, dig a trench or whatever may be needed. So there are lots of other constraints. And in particular, women face a lot of, of constraints in adopting agricultural technologies and practices. Um, there are things such as even social norms, for example, that may prohibit women from you know, doing certain things in the community or engaging in certain types of practices. So awareness is only one of the barriers, but there are many others that, that are faced by, by both men and women. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to, uh, I, there's a bandwidth issue. I'm going to turn off my, my video. Okay, so we'll just have a little bit here, I guess. So there is another interesting question from my wish. Uh, thanks for the presentation. In the beginning, it was made clear that gender is not equal to women. But all the examples shared in the presentation was for comparing men and women. Are the examples of lion gender lands without comparison of the sex of individuals? Um, I mean, sex is one of the, the most important 
characteristics that we look at in gender analysis, but there are others as well. Age is becoming increasingly another identifying characteristic that more and more research is being done about. So understanding youth needs, youth preferences, constraints to engaging in agriculture, um, and you know, marital status is another important one. Are there, you know, different do widows, for example, face different constraints than young women in male-headed households with children. There's a lot of different identifying characteristics that can influence outcomes of different men and women. But I think uh, gender is fundamentally about roles and relationships between, between men and women, you know, uh, boys and girls. It, those, now there are all kinds of, of nuances on this in terms of um, in some societies certain certain men may take on female roles and a gender analysis would get at that but to pick up on what elizabeth said on one of the concerns i have is that a lot of times when gender is mentioned people only pay attention to women and then when youth is mentioned, they only think about young men and not looking at the intersection of that, for example, what are the different um, aspirations, resources, uh, constraints of young, young men and women. And there's some very good work on that in the recent um, ATOR report, Annual Ten Trends and Outlook report. Um, from resex, uh, for example, or um, you know, a number of, of good studies on that. But I just want to get our thinking, and then, then as Elizabeth also said, it's important to look throughout the life cycle because uh, while there's a, we need to pay a lot of attention to um, youth. There's also an issue of the elderly, and elderly becoming often very vulnerable. So it's good to look look through the whole life cycle. Okay, so let's move to the next question. And one of our participants wanted to find out how do you go about undertaking gender research to measure quality of life for a particular intervention? Uh, I think the question refers to uh, the achievements. So typically development interventions will have a target set of outcomes that they're looking at. It might be increasing agricultural yields, it might be increasing incomes, it might be improving nutritional status of children. Um, <clears throat> I think what the gender research and the gender lens can bring to that intervention is to look at differences between men and women and how those outcomes are realized. Sometimes having both men and women participate in a program can actually influence the outcomes, typically in a, in a positive way, um, by engaging multiple members of the same household in the intervention and understanding what their roles are in achieving those outcomes. So I think. You know, these are typically defined by a project, the outcomes that are looked at, the well-being outcomes, but you can go a step further and collect uh, sex disaggregated data and do qualitative research to understand the sort of pathways through which those outcomes are achieved. That's a, a really good um, uh, answer. And to add a specific example on that, I think all we, um, Projects don't always think through what are all the welfare outcomes or well-being outcomes. And as an example, there was a project in Mozambique that gave um, dairy cows and training to the head of household, men. But uh, women were the ones who were then responsible for caring for the cows. And so uh, women's time burdens increased a lot. Now that wouldn't have shown up in the project's original uh, indicators. And and women didn't were not actually benefiting from any of the 
uh, increases in income. Um, and the project uh, was partnering with us on a gendered analysis of this, and this became apparent, and then they changed the program to actually train both men and women. And even though women's time burdens were still a lot higher, they at least value, felt that they were being appreciated and valued. And I think so it, um, by putting a gender lens on, we sometimes see bigger, broader uh, welfare outcomes than we might have, especially when, when somebody just measures income at the household level you will miss a lot of welfare outcomes. Thanks, Ruth. Um, there is another more or less technical question. Um, existing data sets, for example, Alice and Mass and DHS did not capture key indicators to be included in computing ProWea. How easy is it to compute ProWea using those data sets and existing data gaps? So <clears throat> the the, the Ella, sorry, not LSMS, the Feed the Future data sets do collect uh, WEA data. Typically, it's the original version of the WEA or the abbreviated version of the WEA, which is a, a subset of the original WEA indicators. The Pro WEA um, has been under development for the last several years and has been tested by a set of projects and been refined based on um, a lot of testing in the field. And so, Ruth, maybe you know the status of when that will be formally launched and available, but presumably the projects that have collected these data will uh, make that data open access at some point in the near future so that those data sets will be available uh, for analysis. And the tools, I believe, are already available to be applied and used. So if you are collecting new data, you can go ahead and collect ProWEA data, but it's a relatively newer tool, so there isn't a lot of data, existing data that people can access presently on that. No, I, you're right. Uh, currently, you cannot, uh, if anybody wants to collect ProWEA data, um, you can approach us and we'll, we'll, we'll share the latest version of the instrument with you um, and and you can take the training course on that. Um, you can't, we do have, um, uh, we are working with, but oh, so first of all, you cannot compute the pro way without interviewing men and women um, with this instrument. You can't use existing data for that. However, we are working with uh, EFAD, for example, to integrate the ProWEA with their, their existing impact assessment questionnaires, which are based on the um, LSMS. And so um, that reduces the, the amount of additional questions that have to be asked. And I'll give an advertising, we're now working with the 50 by 2030 initiative on jointly developing a national level uh, women's empowerment metric for national statistical systems, but that's uh, probably a couple of years off before those data sets are available. Okay. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, there is uh, one question about how we actually do the research, I guess. I, I hope I interpreted correctly. It reads as, how do we ensure gender representation in administration of research instruments? I, I think it's about how, mm -hmm. how do we ensure that there is a good gender balance, gender representation among the researchers and the numerators and so on and so forth. <coughs> mm -hmm. I think that, you know, the last slide that I presented with the conclusions um, just kind of gives a little flavor of how you might think about integrating gender in every <coughs> stage of the research process. I think it's important to bring gender experts in or at least have gender experts reviewing proposals, reviewing research plans from the beginning when you're doing, and, and even the selection of topics that a, a research organization may prioritize. To, um, to ensure that topics related to gender are really integrated across the research portfolio. Um, and 
you know, it does take some level of, of expertise and, and understanding to be able to build in those gender specific questions. And there are lots and lots of resources available out there. But I think bringing gender experts in, and at least an advisory role would be important from the beginning. And then following that through, making sure that, that budgets for you know, gender research are not cut. You know, implementing a, a sex disaggregated survey does take uh, some amount of research uh, resources to do that. Um, you know, it can lengthen the uh, length of a household survey, for example, because you have to ask both men and women in the household. Um, so think about those things. Think about how deep you want to go. If you can't do something as full blown as the WEA, there are other indicators that you could add, or a few questions here and there that can help you get more at individual indicators. So. Um, but thinking about these things from the beginning at the start of a project and then really following through on them is going to be really important for, for integrating gender into your research activity. One additional point is on the data collection. Um, in, in a society that is very sex segregated, where women would not be allowed to come out or where uh, men would not be allowed to um, interview a woman by herself, then it's important to have female enumerators as well. Our preference in most places is to have both women and men as enumerators so that they can, um, you know, men interview men and women interview women. Um, in some places, it doesn't matter as much, but the default is assume you should should have both. Now, then, then the counter that we often get is, oh well, we can't possibly get get female enumerators who can go to the field. And um, already, more than twenty years ago, in in a place like Pakistan, um, IFPRI was able to show that no, in fact, you actually can. Uh, field teams of, of women enumerators. And certainly our work in Bangladesh um, also shows that even in a place that has um, has strong gender norms of female seclusion, it has been possible to do this. So um, it's worth really pushing for that. Okay, thanks, Ruth. And building on the discussion on how much time it all takes, there is a, a question. What's a realistic time to expect changes in empowerment? I find many projects are two, three years, often too short to notice differences, or we don't know what we hand over, or should we aim lower? Our work in Bangladesh is, is a very good example of where with deliberate effect um, you can see marked increases in empowerment within uh, three years. Um, when, the, um, when the first, uh, when Feed the Future got started there, Bangladesh had the lowest um, WEA scores and the USAID mission and the government took that seriously, designed projects to address that. And, and we have seen increases both at the, the national level and then in particular projects, quite remarkable increases. Um, the ANGEL project, for example, and I won't go into all the details on it, has, has been able to show this and is being scaled up nationally now. The big lesson, though, of that is that it doesn't happen by accident. It really requires deliberate work on this. And in particular, we find across most of the projects that are in this ProWEA portfolio um, that the projects that have done some form of work with men as well as women on addressing how uh, social norms can be harmful, um, <laughs> the importance of, of women's empowerment for overall household well-being. That as we, um, as, as the projects have, have built that in, we see greater uh, 
improvements in empowerment than where it's just a a sort of a um, project that only addresses, um, say, productivity. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, I think people are actually interested in knowing about more examples where WEA has actually informed policy uh, because there was this question. Do you have examples where WEA has informed policy and if yes, in which countries? So you could expand a little bit more on that. I think it would be useful. Uh, sure. I, um, I would, I think what we can do is in the, the, editing of the slide deck will put in some more references to um, examples of this from Bangladesh, which has been, um, you know, quite um, remarkable in, in how um, showing this has informed policy. In As one anecdote, when our Director General and um, Akhtar Ahmed, our, our chief of party in Bangladesh, were meeting um, with the president and key officials in Bangladesh. Um, they were asked, well, why is this one district um, really high in, uh, seemingly high in income, but uh, high in malnutrition, and this other district has much lower income levels, but lower malnutrition? And Akhtar was able to say, well, actually, the, the district with high um, income also has high gender inequality and low women's empowerment, whereas the one with low income has higher women's empowerment. And therefore, the income that a household does receive, women have more say over it, and, more, and it's translated more into well-being of the children, for example. That got policymakers' attention, and they said, "Oh, okay. Then how do then? Yes, uh, women's empowerment does have this instrumental value as well as being something that you could advocate for on just a human rights grounds." And that uh, was a, a really um, important outcome. I'm paraphrasing this much more complex story, but I think. Um, there are really important lessons there where having, especially national level data where you can compare different parts of the country and then use the data also to examine differences by, by age, education levels, and a range of other factors. Um, um, my colleagues uh, um, have also done analysis from Ghana and, and uh, Bangladesh and other countries on how uh, women's empowerment does translate into child nutrition, for example. And that's that's been helpful in getting more attention to to this. I think the the way it can also be used in a project setting, uh, for example. And what's what's nice about it is that it breaks down these different aspects of women's agency. Um, in ways that help you really understand what are the key determinants of women's disempowerment in a particular context. And so when you have that information, at, you know, at the start of a project or, you know, the baseline um, survey for a project, you can make changes to the design of a particular intervention to make sure that those areas of women's disempowerment are being addressed. So, for example, if it's um, women are disempowered in terms of participating in production decisions or income decisions, there are different um, interventions that can be added on to, say, an agricultural intervention, such as a household dialogue where people do budgeting together. They have open conversations about um, these kinds of joint decisions and how they're made and what people's preferences are that can really help address those areas of disempowerment. So it's it's important, not just at a policy level, but also down to a project level. If, if I can add one more uh, example on um, how it can be used as, as even a diagnostic, not just for monitoring changes, but at baseline, use that as a diagnostic. So for example, 
um, and this is why it's important to collect from both men and women. One of the indicators is access to uh, and control over credit. If you just collected it uh, for women, you would see that um, credit uh, is often one of the, the highest uh, areas of disempowerment for women. And then you might go in and say, oh, we, we need to do a um, microfinance program to give women credit access. If you didn't also collect the data from men and see that men are also really disempowered on credit, then that microfinance program <clears throat> might become the only source of credit and men would then pressure their wives to take out credit for men's enterprises. Um, so it wouldn't have the effect you were anticipating. So if you uh, look at the, the Feed the Future baseline data, what we have done in that is shown the, the areas of disempowerment for men and women across different countries. And then you can say, okay, this is the biggest area of disempowerment. In most cases, women are overall more disempowered than men, but on certain indicators, men may be more disempowered than women. <laughs> And, and you need to, you know, looking at both of that, those issues can help you design uh, programs that address those key gaps. Okay, thanks. And uh, Hazel Malapit, who is, uh, of course, very much engaged in, in the way uh, and actually with this effort, uh, add uh, via comments online that Riwe influencing policy, she thinks that the Malabo Declaration is a, is a good example. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and actually, linked to that, we had a question which I'm okay. To... Uh, uh, um, can I just chime in on what that is? Um, oh, sure. The, the Malabo Declaration uh, mm. does include um, uh, women's empowerment um, and using the the domains of empowerment from the WEA as uh, part of the declaration of, of aims and objectives or goals. Um, and then that follows through to countries that are trying to meet, you know, show progress on the Malabo declarations. Um, and so that's one reason why we are also trying to develop good indicators at the national level for showing progress on that. Thanks. Go on, Evgenia. Okay. okay, yes. So we actually had a question that mentioned the Malabo, the Malabo Declaration, um, uh, and I'm going to read it out um, because the person took the care to write this um, thoughts in detail. So enhancing regional food trade in Africa has become a key issue towards achieving the aspirations of African Union agenda and the Malabo Declaration. From a more global point of view, away from the household level, what would you see as potential related issues when looking at integrating gender in policy research and outreach under the subject of regional trade? How would you measure gender within this context and what are the indicators to measure their participation empowerment? I guess there means women's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good question. Oh, yeah. go ahead, Ruth. Um, um, our colleague, uh, Ismail Fofana has a chapter on that in the um, in the ATOR report that I mentioned again, um, using just not uh, using the example of regional trade. And there is a whole literature on gender and trade issues where you look at how um, trade restrictions or opening up of trade uh, is likely to affect the um, the enterprises, I'll put it that way, that men and women are associated with. And um, there's even now some, um, uh, some of the CGE modeling tools and, and the, um, there are some sex disaggregated uh, SAMs, uh, data sets that can be used for this kind of modeling where you can, can start to look at what are the effects 
of uh, opening up of trade on um, on gender uh, likely gendered outcomes of that. Um, so we'll we will add some of those resources into the to the um, PowerPoint as well. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Uh, I think we will take maybe a couple of more questions and then round this up. Uh, there was one specific question that was asked really early in the uh, presentation about the examples of, um, let me see, adoption of good fishery practices. We have uh, some examples of the use and best integrated practices for sm small scale fish and fishing. And I guess this mm -hmm. is related again to how men and women adopt these practices differently, mm -hmm. or maybe how women can be empowered with this. It's not quite clear, but this is the question. So if you can anything uh, can comment anything on that, that would mm -hmm. be appreciated. Yeah, it's it's not really an area that we've done a lot of research on. Um, I suspect that we might find some resources um at other cgr centers who work more on fisheries um the work we've done on climate smart um, agriculture has been focused mostly in sub-saharan africa um where you know fisheries are important in, in some communities but not in a lot of the ones that we worked in um, in bangladesh obviously it, it is more important but it's not something that we've uh, dug deep into to look at um, what are the different fisheries practices that men and women prefer and that they're aware of and that people seem to be adopting and the differences in adoption rates and things like that. Uh, Ruth, are you aware of any specific resources on that? Yeah, I would I would refer people to WorldFish and um, they've had quite a number of studies, uh, both in Africa and in uh, Bangladesh, Cambodia, and, and uh, Asia. So um, we'll try to put in, or those who want more information can can send us an uh, email and we'll put them in touch on that. But, uh, on okay. fisheries in particular, men and women often play different roles. And so uh, like it, it may be that men are going out and doing the fishing and then women are doing the, the processing and trading um, factors and um, issues related to that. Okay, thanks Ruth. Uh, I think it's a good time now to maybe round up our presentation and our Q&A. There were many questions that we did not have the time to address in this one um, and some comments which uh, we'll make sure to relate to Elizabeth mm -hmm. and Ruth. Uh, so there probably will be some follow-up on one of our websites about this webinar where we can address those questions. Some of the wishes that we've heard were uh, about sharing this information widely and um, specifically the ProWare paper uh, okay, sorry, it's it's not that one. Um, yeah, people are interested in the in the pro way and where and please promote your distance learning material on where widely. That's kind of something people are really looking forward to. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there are some technical questions on how you assign weights to where in where, okay. for example. So we'll probably not go into these right. nitty gritty no. details right now, but yeah, it's all online yeah. and will be shared with yeah. people. So thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I want to thank Elizabeth and, and Ruth and David for participating in this webinar. I think it's been great. And just to repeat that the recording will be available online as well as the slides and other follow-ups like links and useful resources. So thank you for being with us and goodbye. Thank Have you. A good day. <laughs>